I've done quite a lot of opinion videos on this channel in addition to the story stuff because when things happen I like to look at them and talk about them and one thing I'm not afraid of calling out is elitism between different fans of different motorsports because it always seems to end up going that way. And I don't know if it's because of social media allowing these echo chambers to flood out into the internet's battleground that is Twitter, but it seems to have gotten worse in the last six years or so. You've got F1 superiority because that's the pinnacle. Anyone who doesn't make it to F1 is a failed driver and IndyCar is for F1 rejects. And NASCAR stands for non-athletic sports centred around rednecks, and they are too dumb to be able to turn right. Then you've got the other sides. Sports car fans are the rugby fans of motorsport, who feel the need to mention sports cars whenever F1 has a smooth brain moment, while IndyCar Reddit feels the need to constantly dunk on Formula 1 and tell the world that IndyCar is better, while simultaneously gatekeeping the ever-living out of it. Why can't we all just enjoy what we want to enjoy without needing to comment on other stuff? But there was one moment in 2019 when the F1 elitists were huffing the proverbial copium, when two-time world champion and best driver of his generation Fernando Alonso failed to qualify for the 500 miles of turning left. The Indy 500. The Indy 500 is a great race. In fact, it's the most attended single sporting event in the world. The World Cup will have the bigger television numbers and so will the Super Bowl, but the Indy 500 sees 257,000 or so people in the seats and the infield can hold another 400,000 or so. So 600,000 plus if it's a complete and utter sellout. Put into perspective, the population of Indianapolis is around 880,000 or so, with the population of Belfast turning up for a few days in May. Part of the spectacle is the speed. In qualifying, the cars will be tricked out to run as fast as possible and will be going at or above 240 miles an hour into Turn 1 and coming out of Turn 2 above 215. An F1 car will top out at about 230 for reference. These guys and girls will be racing around 230 in the race and dogfighting at those speeds with no room for error. There's no runoff, there's no gravel, there's no tyre walls. For a time it was just concrete, which has since been replaced by safer barriers. You only have to look at something like Scott Dixon's accident in the 2017 edition of this particular event when he went upside down and a foot that way or so and he would have landed on his head onto the barrier. It's a very scary crash. If you're not seeing it, it's, it's mental. But for Alonso, it was his second crack at the famous oval. The Spaniard had come in for that just-mentioned 2017 race and had done some early testing in the DW12 that year at Barber Motorsports Park to get used to things driving an unbranded Andretti car. In 2018, plans were put in place to take things to the next level, at least for 2019 anyway. Plan was to have Alonso in a full-blown McLaren entry, partnered with two champions for a full-time IndyCar season, and McLaren had spoken to Will Power and Scott Dixon about creating a supergroup with Nando, but they both chose to stay at their respective teams. Dixon chose to stay at Ganassi, and Power chose to stay at Penske. And Alonso wasn't the first F1 champion to have a crack at the Oval. Graham Hill and Jim Clark took it on, and won, with Hill doing so as a rookie. Emerson Fittipaldi, Jackie Stewart, Nigel Mansell, also F1 champions that have had a go, and Jack Brabham attempted it in 1964, in a Brabham. Alonso was looking to enter a very exclusive club along with Hill though. The previous year, he'd won Le Mans, so Indy was the last box left to tick. McLaren was up against a bit of a brick wall though, because the engine suppliers were a bit ooing and ahhing about what they were going to do. Chevrolet was thinking, can we really supply another team, while Honda was thinking, after what he said about our engines, we're not working with Fernando again. So after the US Grand Prix in 2018, McLaren put their 2019 IndyCar program on ice and committed itself to Formula One. But in the winter of 2018, McLaren approved a one-off entry into the 2019 Indy 500 with Alonso as the driver, and collaborated with Carlin in what they called a logistical and operational partnership. On top of this, the recently departed Jill de Ferran became Alonso's coach, and Bob Fernley, formerly a Force India and someone who had 80s kart experience, ran the show. The car had changed since Alonso last ran. The DW12, with its rear wheel fairings and other pieces of aero, had been ditched for a simpler aero package on what is now the IR18. Still the same base chassis, but this was now the Universal Aero Kit or something along those lines. From what I can tell, it was designed to lower the amount of topside aero and reduce dirty air because Chevrolet and Honda had their own kits that was causing an aero arms race and cost to increase. I think that's what I gather from it all anyway. This caused the car to handle a little differently, but Alonso was happy with the car and did a test at Texas before he had to take part in the refresher session at Indianapolis. This was a required part of getting onto the grid. Nobody is above this. 
not even Fernando Alonso, certainly not Jim Clark. Jim Clark had to do the rookie orientation at Indianapolis, but this was cut short by weather and electrical issues. It took him two days to complete the course, but was then stopped by another electrical problem before he crashed the car on the 15th of May. Crashing a car is always a bad thing. It's bad financially, it's bad for the mechanics that have to rebuild it, it's bad for driver confidence, and it can be bad for driver ego as well. But the problem was, this was just one thing in a large list of what can only be described as a comedy of errors. That test I just told you about at Texas, well, when McLaren got there, they hadn't got a steering wheel. So they had to go around looking for one, and eventually Zach Brown had to call in a bunch of favours at Cosworth to get hold of one. And the team had also discovered that the spare car, which they had got from Carlin, was the wrong shade of orange. The car was sent to Carlin's paint shop that was 30 minutes from the track, but McLaren had supposedly complained about the colour a month ago. With one car being peeled off a safer barrier and the other car being resprayed the correct hex code, McLaren lost two full days of track running. Meanwhile, James Hinchcliffe had binned his car and was out running in the spare about an hour later. Eventually, Alonso got his car back and went out in qualifying. The first runs were looking pretty good until McLaren noticed that the speeds had dropped off considerably. Was it the engine? Was it the setup being totally wrong? It had to be something on the car because the setup wouldn't just stop working like that. So they brought the car back in, tore it apart to figure out what was wrong, only to figure out that the reason the car had gone so slow was because Alonso had picked up a puncture, which McLaren hadn't realised was the case because they'd got the wrong tyre sensors on the car. With all these operational howlers, it meant that McLaren was losing time and Alonso was being pushed further and further and further back. At the latter stages of the month of May, you end up at what is called Bump Day. Bump day is basically where those at the back of the field squabble for the remaining positions. Indy 500 rules are that 33 can start the race. It's basically something that says, nobody is too big for this race and nobody's too good they can't fail. Penske can confirm. Since the year after they went and destroyed everybody with the beast in 1994, they didn't even qualify in 1995, for a variety of reasons. Indy has often prided itself on, if you can scrape together the money and get a car here, you get an attempt at being in this race. You never know, there might be a giant killing moment. The way it worked last year is like this, and this is only a basic overview. On Saturday the 20th of May, so the weekend before the race, the positions between 13 and 30 will be locked in. Teams can have multiple cracks at setting a time, and once they've done a lap they choose between two lanes in the pit lane. In lane 1, you have to void your time, but you get priority access to the track, and in lane 2, you use this if you've already qualified but you want to improve your position. Positions 31 to 33 will be locked in on day 2 after the top 12 have done their qualifying sessions. So really, if more than 33 cars have entered the race, cars outside of the top 30 are guaranteed one attempt, and they just keep on going until the time expires at 5pm Indianapolis time. Alonso, by this point, was 31st behind Pippa Mann, who had put in a time late on to dump Alonso down that position from 30th to 31st, but elsewhere in the paddock, there was more drama brewing. Hunkos Racing was one of the teams that McLaren were fighting with at the back of the pack to get onto the grid. The team had this all-white car, because two sponsors that were supposed to be on board had pulled out just before practice, leaving the car in what iRacing users would call rookie white. It looked sad, really, just a factory fresh car with nothing on it, just the Firestone and Chevrolet logos, not even a number. But this didn't take away any motivation. Hunkos were willing to get the job done and do the best they could, given the situation. Their driver, Kyle Kaiser, then crashed this white car, leaving Hunkos to break out their spare car that was a tad more colourful, being painted in green, orange and white, presumably in anticipation of this sponsor that never came. But this car still had no sponsors on it, and other teams were ready and willing to help the struggling team out if they needed it. McLaren had also reportedly done a deal to buy one of Andretti's setups and some of their spares to help them get onto the grid, either safely or by the skin of their teeth. Rain shortened the pre-bump practice to around 20 minutes where McLaren was starting to struggle. The team had got their setup from somebody else and this being Murica, they don't like using metric like the rest of the world, they insist on using the Imperial system and then go around telling us that we're the ones that are wrong. Now obviously I don't really have a leg to stand on here because I'm British, we use both systems interchangeably. This is an 8mm spanner. This is a quarter inch audio jack. Britain. McLaren had to convert all of the measurements from inches to millimetres and they screwed it up, resulting in Alonso's car scraping against the tarmac and being slower. 
While the session was delayed, McLaren was still working on the car. The bump day festivities got underway and Alonso was provisionally in 32nd with three cars still left to run, so he was right on the edge of being in or out. Sage Karam then went out and did his run and this bumped Alonso down to 33rd, right on what they call the bubble. Kaiser was the last car to go and Alonso was not going to get another run due to the time remaining. Kaiser came out of the final corner and instantly went faster than Alonso had done on the first lap, but over the next three, the pace dropped off in a big way, meaning his average was now starting to drop down where Alonso's was. But Kaiser was able to cross the line with a 227.372 mile an hour four lap average, which bumped Alonso out of the top 33 by 0 0.019 miles an hour. The cash strap team that had been besotted by bad luck was able to qualify for one of the biggest races of the year. The Formula 1 juggernaut with a two-time world champion, often regarded as being the best of his generation, didn't. And I remember all of this happening. Discord watch parties were everywhere because at the time, Formula 1 fans wanted to see what Alonso was capable of. There was that feeling of, he was running at the front last time, he's got some experience now, he'll do better this year, he'll be properly in for a shot of winning it this time round. Although, I don't share the idea that Alonso would have won in 2017. That's just an opinion, it doesn't mean I hate Alonso. I know how you people think. But, those in the know were a little bit more cautious. While they trusted the process, McLaren being a big Formula 1 team despite the issues they'd run into in recent years, they'd partnered themselves with Carlin, who were only in their second year on the IndyCar grid, and all three from that Carlin group did not qualify. And they were the only three that missed out on that top 33. Alonso, Chilton and O'Ward failed to make the grid. Meanwhile at Hunkos, limbs. Kyle Kaiser's second 500, the third go for Hunkos, and as already established, they've bumped out a two-time world champion. McLaren were ridiculed online by IndyCar fans and by a lot of Formula 1 fans as well. IndyCar fans accused them of thinking that it was going to be easy and that all of this sort of comedy of errors list that we've already mentioned before was just karma for thinking it was going to be easy. Meanwhile, there were a lot of F1 elitists that were huffing the proverbial copium because they genuinely thought that Alonso was going to turn up and piss the thing. But, yeah, that never happened. But he would have another go, you know, in 2021 or whenever it was. However, McLaren was gracious in its defeat. There is a rule in the 500 that allows a non-qualifier to buy their way into another car that has made the grid. But McLaren said they weren't going to do it. They held their hands up and said they just weren't good enough. They had a myriad of organisational, logistical and other screw-ups that were down to the team being not organised. Zach Brown should not really be calling in favours to Cosworth. The team should have been better prepared for the switch to a different measurement system and another thing that undid them was using an incorrect gear ratio that cost Alonso a bit of top speed. Zach Brown told ESPN, We were going to build our own wheel. Cosworth, you can buy them off the shelf, but they didn't have any on the shelf, so I had to pull some favours, and Carlin helped us get a steering wheel. So everything in there was factual, but as you can imagine, there's a story behind all those elements. It's not like we unpacked the bags and we forgot a steering wheel, that's not what happened. Everything in there I thought was important. I share what happened. It's tough, because I know it opens yourself up for a lot of criticism, but when you don't perform, I think a good CEO stands up and takes accountability and responsibility for it. Brown said it was a variety of errors, saying that it really started with that test at Texas when they had no steering wheel. He referenced 1986 when Bill Buckner had the ball go through his legs and that was what lost the Boston Red Sox the World Series. But in reality, Boston had lost that series three games ago. The ground ball nutmegging Buckner was just the one thing everybody remembers. Same way that everybody remembers the car being the wrong colour and that being the reason that Alonso failed to qualify for the 2019 Indy 500. McLaren is now an IndyCar team full-time. They compete as the Arrow McLaren IndyCar team and is the outcome of a takeover of Sam Schmidt Motorsports. In the 2023 Indy 500, the team ran some throwback liveries to reference McLaren's long motorsport history, including a Marlboro knockoff and an all-papaya affair in reference to Bruce's old orange F1 and sports cars. Their current drivers are Alex Rossi, David Malukas and Patricio O'Ward, with Kyle Larson coming in from NASCAR. O'Ward was fourth last season. But this race just shows how prepared you've got to be. If you don't have things running as they should, you're probably going to lose an hour here or a day there, depending on how big it is. And you're not going to get that time back unless you fluke something. It's almost like the Indy 500 isn't just turning left. 
So then a look at Alonso's non-qualification at the 2019 Indy 500. If this has been a fun episode for you, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the fine bunch of lads at Patreon for the support. And if you want to help out at a more personal level, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and bobs that you might want or need. Well, the super thanks if you just want to do a one and done donation, and memberships if you want to spam some custom emojis in the comments. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. Mm -hmm.